All right, everybody hear me? Good. Uh, looks like the people coming in has slowed down a bit, so we'll get started. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, rapid processing of NASA satellite data um, and basically using Ceph as our backend to accomplish all this. Uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, this is Steve. We work on the, the same team at SSEC at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, so I'm going to start off a bit with uh, nobody really knows who we are or where we're from, uh, but about SSEC, and then we'll get into the, what we're actually doing. Uh, so the UW Madison Space Science and Engineering Center, um, founded a little over 50 years ago, is one of the pioneering centers in uh, uh, satellite remote sensing technology, so imaging the space from Earth through uh, low Earth orbit or geostationary satellites. Um, a lot of the original hardware on some of the first stuff up there um, came from us. Uh, so uh, the Explorer 7 mission, uh, spin scan camera, the first gold satellite, um, and we, uh, not me, but uh, the high speed photometer that was uh, an instrument on the Hubble was actually developed uh, at SCCC. Uh, other than that, um, pretty much everything worked on the building has something to do with like geosciences or atmospheric research. So there's data validation and calibration uh, for the sensors. Uh, numerical weather prediction modeling, um, the Crop Cooperative Institute of Meteorological Satellite Studies funded by NOAA is located there, and um, there's also ice core drilling, uh, which at first may not sound like it has to do with atmospheric research, but you can look uh, at the depth of the ice and see uh, details of what the atmosphere was doing at the time uh, to go back, you know, 10,000 plus years. Uh, so our projects that me and Steve work on, um, the big one uh, is the NASA VIRS Atmosphere SIPs. We're funded by a NASA contract to uh, do work for them. Um, our main goal is we generate uh, level two and level three NASA products uh, uh, and we work with the NASA science teams to get their uh, algorithms to run on years and years of data efficiently and in a timely manner. Uh, we then uh, this, uh, send these products back to NASA for distribution to the world and the science communities. Um, the primary instrument we work with is VIRS. Um, right now there are two of them in orbit. One is on SNPP, which uh, has been up there since 2012, right? Yeah, 2012. Uh, NOAA 20 uh, went up in 2018. Uh, JPSS-2 is not in orbit, so it's 2021 is the plan. There's a JPSS-3 that is still planned, assuming uh, nobody cuts the funding for it for probably 2023 or 2024. Um, so these two instruments are in orbit, capturing data 24-7, 365, 14 uh, orbits a day. Um, so we constantly have a stream of data coming in that we have to process uh, multiple times actually to deliver near real time data and then more climate record archival data to NASA. Um, so our data format is the, um, it's time based. Uh, uh, into six minute, we call them granules. Uh, so it's basically what the satellite has seen in a six minute uh, chunk of time. Uh, the pretty picture up here is from obviously Spain from last week. Um, so it's about a 3,200 kilometer swath, which is the width of it. And uh, just in six minutes is actually 3,200 kilometers in um, length so it actually comes out to a very nice time frame and six divides nicely into a day when you uh, uh, break it up. Um, we get orbit files from NASA, they come in two hour uh, orbit files. Um, we break them up and see six minute granules um, and within each of these files is the data for 22 different channels of imagery um, based uh, in uh, uh, visible and to the near infrared, and I think there's one infrared band in there as well. Uh, so all this data comes in, and we have lots and lots of objects. So there's almost 88,000 objects per year per instrument per product. Uh, there's two instruments, 
and probably 15 or 20 products at least uh, for every granule that comes in. So there's many millions of objects per year uh, of this. And then there's also different versions uh, when uh, the algorithm developers send us their code. So, you know, version one versus version 1.2 and you have to have both at the same time for a certain amount of time. What I'm getting at is lots of data all the time. Uh, so if we're not terribly familiar with polar orbiters, um, this is kind of showing you how they work. Obviously polar, they're going you know, through the poles. And it's just showing how the orbits are going during the daytime ascending granules. Um, this isn't real color, this is showing uh, cloud classification, uh, so kind of ice versus water vapor clouds. And so it just kind of slowly paints up or, uh, the Earth. Uh, it images the entire Earth every day. Uh, other than uh, the single uh, viewers instrument, we actually deal with a lot of other satellite data as well because um, you're constantly validating and calibrating against other sensors uh, the big one is the MODIS instrument on the Terra and Aqua satellites, which are from uh, about 99 and 2000, 2001, I believe. Uh, so those records are 15 years long of basically nonstop data that we have to uh, occasionally process and keep on hand at all times for comparisons. Because uh, the kind of MODIS is seen as like the the gold standard, it's been around, it's been calibrated, so it's really really like, okay, does what this new sensor match what MODIS has been telling us? And these records can be, you know, 100 plus terabytes of data easily. Um, our other project we work on is uh, Tropics. It's a collaboration with uh, MIT, us, some other universities. It's funded by NASA as well. Um, this one's pretty cool. It's just kind of getting uh, off the ground. They are not actually in orbit yet, but it's a constellation of six CubeSats, uh, which will be, um, if I get the picture going, there we go, um, constantly orbiting in uh, a 30 degree inclination prograde orbit around the Earth, uh, tropics, it's the tropical region. Um, so this is just another cool thing that we'll be uh, dealing with and having to collect data for six different uh, CubeSats you know, 24-7, 365, doing very similar work for the SIPs. So even more objects, even more data. Uh, but these ones do actually have much lower data, uh, lower data volume due to the type of uh, satellite that they are, or the sensor, actually. Is this one on? Okay. Yep. Uh, so in addition to uh, uh, the polar orbiting satellites, there are also geostationary satellites. Uh, this imagery right here is about 5,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels taken every 10 minutes. Um, and this is just another data source that like more and more geostationary satellites are going up and the time frequency of the measurements is going up and so we need lots more storage space. Scalable storage space. <laughs> yes. So when we were just deciding like, you know, how are we going to accomplish all this? We said, well, what are our storage requirements? Well, we're going to like have to grow our cluster by a petabyte per year and we need good data replication and we're going to have hundreds of millions of objects, something that works really well for our high throughput computing because that's kind of what we do, uh, needs to be affordable, work with our VMs. Um, we tried numerous cluster file systems to get here. We used to use Gluster way back in the day. That really didn't scale. Um, and so yeah, we uh, decided on CEP and we've been using that for the last four or five years now and that's worked great. Um, so this is just a rough number on our data ingest. Uh, we're ingesting 600 gigabytes per day. Uh, in producing our products that we're delivering to NASA, we're producing another 500 gigs per day. Then there's another 700 gigs of other products being created per day, 30,000 ob objects per day. And when we really get the system going and we're producing, producing products and looking back at historical records, we could easily be doing 10 terabytes a day. Um, 
So now I'm going to just kind of go a little bit through how data flows through our system. So NAS is collecting all this data for us, and um, we're basically sitting there listening listing files on NASA server and saying, oh, there's a file that we're interested in. We use uh, RabbitMQ for a lot of work. Uh, so we'll list the files, we'll send a message to RabbitMQ, and a worker will pick that off the message, say, hey, I'm gonna download this file, and he just goes and stores it in our Ceph uh, cluster. We, I should mention, we are using uh, native Rados for the majority of our seven petabytes. Um, I'll go more into that choice later. But for every file that we store in Ceph, uh, we get a, we, we put an entry in our database like, hey, this file, this size, this checksum, was downloaded at this time, uh, it's the sensor satellite instrument. Put an entry in our database. Uh, we use that for routine checksumming of files just to make sure integrity is because we came from Gluster, we, get, we were used to having to check on all of our files, make sure that they're not getting corrupted. Ceph hasn't really done that, but we still do the checks anyways. Um, this is kind of an interesting little tool we wrote. Uh, we call it PG Track. What it does is it says, hey, database, give me your state right now. So it takes that transaction ID and then it says, what has happened since that last ran? And so every time we insert a file into the database, Rabbit PG Track will take that, make a step URL, send that off to work queues, and we have numerous downstream products listening to that. So as soon as a file is stored in our Ceph archive, somebody else might pop that off and start doing work with it that we need to be done. Uh, this is another interesting tool that we developed for in-house. We call it Rados Lite. Uh, it's a Python tool. It, pretty much all of our tools use access it. So one of the things it does is it just provides, an, uh, so we have kind of a Ceph URL here, which has a pool name Arch. We're using namespaces and file names. And so it's kind of a nice little object that we just pass around in our rabbit messages like, hey, this object, go get this and do whatever operation you want to do on it. Um, one of the, one of the things, um, the, the pool alignment? you can speak to this more, the EC pool or the, the alignment. Yeah, so like you said, we mostly use Libredos and uh, way, not way back when, maybe two years ago, we were migrating from a K4 M1 pool to a K6 M2 pool. And it turned out that, um, I think it was by coincidence that the, the pool alignment, because we're doing everything with Libredos, so we kind of actually have to worry about that. Um, the pool alignment, how it was calculated, is changed between the original pools that this cluster was built with way back on like Hammer, and then when the new pool was created, uh, probably on Luminous, I believe. So like we, we wrote, made this new pool and we actually couldn't write a single object into it or, or like it only wrote up to the, like a first 4K or something of the object. So we actually ended up uh, figuring that one out and pushing a patch upstream for the, the Python bindings. Uh, other than that, using uh, straight libradles uh, and Python for everything has worked really well for us. Yeah, so our Rados Lite, you know, we're sh demonstrating a stat here, but you know, get, put, and uh, get these bytes out of this file, which uh, leads me to my next slide. So we developed this application called PDS Serve. So our data, our raw level zero data comes in five gigabyte files. And we, because this is like the official level zero product, we, we don't want to really chop it up into small chunks and refactor it. So what we do is we, one of the first things we do when a file comes in is we index where every one minute block of that data starts so that when our application goes to download the file, it can just go grab those bytes. What we had seen with uh, this is, you know, you get a file and because in that two hour block there's, um, there's 20 different six minute chunks for our six minute granules and when all 20 Compute nodes grab that exact same file, 
the, the time to download that really went up. And we're like, shouldn't take that long. But it was sort of kind of serial, like one object, one server would get it, then the next, and the next. It was like and, a factor of time speed up. Actually, like, it would just take hours to do something that would normally take 10 minutes to do just because you're hitting a single OSD with 20 requests for a five gigabyte file at a time. Yep. So, um, so the, the first thing we do when we get these files, we index it, we throw them in a relational database. And now when our code runs on our compute nodes, it, can, it calls our Rados Lite function, says Rados Lite get from this byte to this byte, downloads just that chunk of data it needs, added a lot of efficiency. Um, yeah. I think so, it, it might be worth mentioning quick. It seems from talking to people yesterday and whatnot, we seem to be a very uh, unique outlier in actually using libRados. Everybody seems to be using CephFS or Rados uh, gateway even in the scientific community. Uh, so we're, we're brave or I don't know what idiots. <laughs> yeah, no, I would agree with that statement that Libre, uh, if you haven't checked out Librados, I personally, like, like initially when we started out, we just call shell out Rados get this file to the local node. But since we're a Python shop and everything we do is Python, why not just have, use Librados and get that file directly. And that's worked out really well for us. Uh, the other part of our system is we rely on Kubernetes heavily for routine services like that PDS serve that I was just talking about. Uh, for us, a, a container oftentimes consists of sitting there listening for a work queue, picking a message off of that queue, pulling that file out of Ceph, storing some metadata back in a relational database whether it be, hey, this, this granule has this geolocation, it has these characteristics in the scene because scientists want to search for different characteristics. And so uh, we have numerous containers running in Kubernetes that are just pulling data, grabbing metadata out, putting it back, or providing API services for searching for our data. Um, I said we primarily do Rados, but there are, there are times where we want to have, um, where we need POSIX. And so for this, we use CEPFS. So this is an instance of uh, NASA Worldview. Our scientists use it to look at their products. And this demo is going to go through. Uh, it's overlaying like uh, deep blue aerosol oceans on this. And they can scan through their data. They can compare different results. Um, but to do this, um, N NASA provides this tool to uh, the community, but you need to have a, they actually provide it as a Docker container, so we just threw it in Kubernetes, but it needs POSIX storage space, and we're like, oh, great, we'll throw CephFS at it and just feed our granules in here, and uh, it is a tool that our science team uses for studying their products. So, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention HT Condor because it was developed at UW-Madison. Uh, we use HTC Condor for all of our computing. And I like to say HT Condor plus Ceph is uh, driving science forward. And by that I mean, we, our primary goal is to support our science team. They are developing algorithms uh, like that deep blue aerosol or those cloud retrievals. And in order to do that, and you know, so they'll look at a granule and they'll be like, oh, there's a little problem here and they'll make a little tweak. But then how does that tweak affect six years of data? And so they need an easy way to go back and look at six years of data and see what happened. And so our goal is to reprocess that data such that when they come in the next day, sitting on their desk is a video showing the impacts of the changes they made from yesterday to the, till today. So we accomplish this by running a cluster. So they'll submit their version, we'll send it out to our cluster, reprocess years of data, boil it down to a simple level three file that they can quickly open in, in MATLAB or whatever and see the impact of their algorithm what got better, what got worse. Um, 
our HT Condor cluster consists of roughly 100 nodes, 2,400 cores. It all has one gigabit networking, um, a lot of RAM per core just because of the processing needs. Uh, but then we have our Ceph cluster, which is 48 OSDs servers with 999 OSDs. That's at seven petabytes. Those all have tw uh, 10 gigabit network links that are bonded together, so we get 20. Uh, but the beauty is during heavy processing, we will have hours upon hours of sustained 10 gigabytes per second um, to our compute nodes for processing. Um, so this slide is just a few of our graphs for showing, uh, like at the bottom right here is just heavy level three processing. It's a lot of just pull down this granule, grab the, grab the data that the scientist is interested in, grid it up, put it in a level three file, and that's kind of the product they're gonna look at. Um, the, the middle one is kind of a throughput on our whole switch stack. The top one's just some processing from some time. Um, at this, it's good to mention, these stats didn't actually come out of, uh, uh, it came out of a, an Isinga check that we used with Seth, uh, but since these ones were taken, I found these screenshots from a while ago. Um, like we started using the Seth Manager Prometheus exporter. It's awesome, I definitely recommend it to people. Um, if you go through the Seth uh, GitHub, uh, there's somewhere a folder called Grafana and they have a bunch of dashboards in there that you just export and import directly into a Grafana instance and once you point your stuff cluster to it, it kind of, it mostly works magically. You gotta do a little tweaking here and there, but uh, highly recommend it. Yeah, what he said. Um, so we also have our own processing workflow management. I'm not really gonna go through all this, but what I do wanna highlight is a lot of times for, so yeah, every, every scientist wants to see their data processed on the whole record, but really what they want is, hey, I wanna see my new algorithm processed over just this one little site here and just give me every granule and can I have that in the next hour? And, and if we can fill their needs of giving this data back to them an hour later while the algorithm is still in their head and their changes are fresh in their mind, they can actually, like in my mind, it helps them do science and, and do stuff better. So uh, we use our databases heavily, like find all the granules that see this particular location over the entire six year record, schedule them, move them to the head of the list for priority, get that data to them as fast as possible. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, um, I mentioned we used Gluster. Way back in the day, we invented this thing we called uh, DOG, the Data Access Working Group. It was a fuse file system that prevented, it kind of aggregated a whole bunch of different storage clusters. You couldn't really expand Gluster. They said you could, but you couldn't. Uh, so what we did is found a way to glue that all together and make it useful. Um, because we're putting all of our objects in Rados and our science team doesn't really know what an object store is, we wanted a way to provide them POSIX access to all these files. So we developed this fuse layer, which has a stub file. So the stub file is shown right here. And all it says is, hey, this file is at this archive we call Archflow 3 with this path. Here's the size and the timestamp. And with that information, this Fuse client we wrote presents that, and it just looks like a file that they can just read. Uh, we don't give them write access, but they can troll around a directory tree, have a, and they're actually reading data straight off of Librados, and they have no clue they're doing it. So I don't know that I would recommend, like back in the day, we were planning to make this a tool that like other people in the Ceph community would use with the improvements to CephFS, I'm not sure that's needed anymore, but it was an interesting tool that we made use of. And Kevin. All right, uh, so another tool that we wrote to track everything, uh, 
as well on Liberatos uh, as a, a CephDB. Um, it's pretty almost self-explanatory just by the name of it. It's a database of everything in a Ceph pool. Uh, you kind of just point it at a pool and it does an LS on it. Um, and for our main pool, it takes 10 hours to list the you know almost 90 million objects. Uh, but then it just stores that with some metadata. And I think that, yeah, the picture just shows a basic metadata of the object in the cluster, namespace pool, size, basically what you get back from a radio stat. Uh, so it's constantly running in the background on some random server, and it just constantly updates the metadata. Uh, it keeps run information in there. Um, and we, it's kind of important to have this completely separate from everything else because all of our other databases, like every file in Ceph is in at least three databases, but most of the other ones except this one are linked through that PG track tool. So if you delete it from you know, our ingest database, it actually gets deleted from the main database as well. And oops. Uh, so this is another good way to keep track of everything. And when somebody fat fingers a delete in Postgres, um, you know, we still actually know the object exists somewhere in stuff and we can kind of go back and find it. Uh, growing pains, uh, we've been started a long, not too long ago, four, four years ago, 2015 maybe. Um, coming from the Gluster world, not much uh, CPU and memory was really used for server, so our original servers were terribly undersized. Um, the cluster we have now grew from six OSD servers up to the 48 it currently is. Um, you know, like we said, adding about a petabyte a year or so. Um, we've had a few full cluster outages, unfortunately, uh, which has led us into some different design choices uh, even recently. Um, the notable ones are a few years ago, I did a small reweight by utilization on a Friday afternoon. Um, and the whole cluster just panicked. Um, and everything started getting out of sync. Everything was starting to crashing. The OSDs were flap, flapping for hours. Um, and it just some, seemed like a matter of the mons were having problems keeping up with the, uh, the changes that the cluster was making in the OSD map. And that is a case where it just, you know, you set all the no out flags, so all the changes stopped, waited half a day, maybe a full day, and you know, eventually the cluster got healthy and you carefully removed those no out changes to uh, put it back in operation and hope it didn't freak out again. Uh, the other one, which was way worse, actually, was, uh, I don't know, September last year or so, is mid-mimic upgrade, which made it even funner because I couldn't figure out if it was the upgrade that caused it or something else. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about upgrading the mimic from Luminos. Um, I'm pretty positive it wasn't that. Uh, it's more of the fact of the scale of that cluster. You know, it just keeps growing and growing, and at the time, we are 800 OSDs or whatever in six petabytes. Um, and what ended up happening was really similar to the first one. You know, everything was flapping, crashing, and um, just the cluster was just thrashing itself, updating the OSD maps uh, super frequently. The mons couldn't keep up. And what it seemed like is the mons were just spinning on their, um, on reading the OSD map, because they, and then they would time out on the leases, so they would have to constantly re-electing re a quorum. Um, so it was just constantly doing that and that and that. And what, what really ended up getting it going was increasing the, the lease time probably helped and some very uh, insane aggressive caching settings on the mons to get them to stop having to read the OSD map off a of disk every time they reelected a quorum. And uh, a big thanks to the Ceph user for both of these problems. Um, the Ceph users list for helping us and Sage for helping with the, the, the September issue. Eventually, we did get everything back up. Um, we, we've never lost an object despite any of these problems um, and actually no corruption. Uh, despite um, the 2018 problem where uh, some servers were thrashing to the point where they just went unresponsive and I had to do code reboots um, on them. Uh, we did get a bunch of corrupted objects from that, uh, but due to the erasure coding, uh, I just found them, took care of it, and everything was great.
Uh, so for scaling, I, the lesson learned here is pay attention to some of your settings. Um, once you hit a certain spot, they, um, you need to be careful. Uh, so our architecture, as I mentioned, we've been growing constantly over uh, the last five years. Uh, we got four, six, eight, 10, 12, and terabyte uh, nearline SAS, uh, and some 10K SAS. We have two clusters, and due to this last big outage problem, we used to have this large ARC cluster, archive. Everything was there. We decided to split off a small five node cluster, um, so all of our processing happens on that one. Um, and all the ingest, and then after 30 days, it all kind of just moves to the other one through some scripting that we have. Uh, we're mostly a Dell shop, um, 24 OSDs is a node usually, uh, and 20 gigabit networking. Uh, we don't have any SSDs. Um, we're government NASA contracts, so we actually don't have that much money <laughs> for fast stuff. Um, and some performance numbers that was actually kind of surprising from some testing that I was recently doing because um, I wanted to see how good CephFS was versus uh, what we've been doing with Live Brados. Um, so this one's uh, pretty simple. Uh, we're just running a basic algorithm on a granule and usually we pull the object into DevSHM and there's two different methods. One is directly, one's using the PDS server to get that chunk of data and CephFS was actually faster than copying into DevSHM, and that's doing the reading and direct writing directly off of CephFS. But that's only a single granule, so what happens when you scale up? So then you do 100 granules, uh, 48 at a time on a server, and uh, CephFS is still doing great. It's hardly noticing any problems. Okay. Scale up even more. Let's let the whole cluster loose. About 24 concurrent, 2,400 concurrent jobs, um, and it's about a 12,000 job queue. It's about a month of uh, data. Um, besides the outlier, we kind of discovered there's a problem with our PDS method of getting data that we have to figure out. Uh, but once again, uh, CephFS is comparable as well, and that's an entire cluster. The source data was about. 350, 400 megabytes, and the output data is about a gigabyte, and that's 1,200 cores doing this. Um, the two different CephFS methods was well, this one is directly the reading writing from CephFS, the other one is copying into DevSHM, do the processing, and then copy back. Uh, so it seems like CephFS uh, can now handle the uh, performance needed for you know very high throughput computing. Um, Luckily, well, maybe not luckily, uh, but just a few days ago, I had a server fail, uh, so I decided to throw in the rebalance graph just because this was our, one of our oldest four terabyte hard drive nodes, so it was only about 44 terabytes of raw disk, and within, you can see, four hours, basically, uh, the entire cluster recovered and peaked at around 28 gigabytes a second during that recovery and um, didn't actually hit too much uh, CPU load to handle that. Future, um, we'd like to move to BlueStore someday. Uh, there's a, a four gigabyte max file size limit that has me a bit iffy. Some of our objects are up to 12 or 13 gigs and I'm not entirely sure how that reacts well. Um, we only have a couple minutes left so I'm just gonna stop for questions I think. Um, one other notable thing is our big cluster is stuck on the bobtail tunables, actually. Uh, it was built with Hammer, uh, so I don't know why it's not using later tunables. Maybe there was a bug in what tunables were set on that. It should have been using Firefly at the least. And on the test cluster, when I moved that up to the latest optimal tunables, obviously everything moved. I am slightly scared to do that on the seven petabyte cluster, but from the CERN presentation, uh, yesterday, they were talking about that cool up map feature to use it and utilize it to slow down the tunables when you make changes like that uh, so the cluster doesn't go into a complete frenzy of remapping everything. Uh, so that might actually be our path forward for that. Um, Technology is used, a uh, whole lot of open source. Open source community is awesome. Thank you to everybody that contributes there. 
and maybe one or two questions if we got a minute here. No questions? Yeah. Yeah, see if we can hear you. Um, hi, I'm um, just wondering, uh, you're using Ratio Coding 6 plus 2, why not um, something like 9 plus 3, or why was your choice? Uh, six plus two originally was four plus one, uh, only because we didn't have a, we had started with six servers and couldn't do anything about it with two parity bits and low overhead. Um, so six plus two seemed decent with the thirty three percent overhead, and uh, it's worked well for us. All right, uh, thank you. <laughs>